Hey guys, it's me, Professor Dean. Welcome back to my YouTube channel. On this video, we're going to be covering increased intracranial pressure. Now, before we get started, as always, I'm going to ask you to please support me and support this channel by liking this video. You're going to love it. Go ahead and give it a thumbs up now so you don't forget. Subscribe to my channel if you have done so already. And be sure to check out my website, nexusnursinginstitute.com. There you can sign up for a one-on-one -on -one private tutoring session. Maybe you want to pick my brain about something. You can sign up for a consultation session. If you're a current nursing student and you have to do really well on your next exam to even stay in the program, check out my audio lessons. And if you've already graduated and you're stud studying for your boards, be sure to sign up for Next Generation NCLEX Review, both part one and part two. Part one, I teach you how to think critically. I teach you about priority. I teach you about delegation. I teach you about different scenarios and phrases that NCLEX uses and where your mind is supposed to go. In part two, I go over actual NCLEX type style questions, rationales, and the most important things you need to understand to be able to apply those concepts onto your exam. So again, you can find me and all those resources at nexusnursinginstitute.com. Almost daily, you can find me covering a variety of nursing topics across my social media platforms, such as TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and right here on YouTube, my handle is the same everywhere, Nexus Nursing. Without any further ado, guys, let's get started. Increased intracranial pressure. First question. True or false? Intracranial pressure is the hydrostatic force measured in the brain CSF compartment. CSF is cerebral spinal fluid. Is this true or is this false? What do you guys think? It's true. That's exactly what... Um, intracranial pressure is, okay? It's the hydrostatic force in the brain, cerebral spinal fluid compartment. You have all this um, extra vascular, usually it's fluid um, in, in the brain, okay? Which of the following clinical manifestations is most indicative of increased intracranial pressure? Would it be bradycardia hypertension and regular respirations, tachycardia hypotension and shallow respirations, hypertension, tachycardia, and hyperventilation, or hypoventilation, tachycardia, and increased alertness? What do you guys think? Very good. Bradycardia, hypertension, and irregular respirations. And we have to be specific with the hypertension. Guess what? That blood pressure is up, but that um, that um, pulse pressure is widened. Okay, that's very important for you guys to know. Now, those of you on the live, what's this called? Very good, Cushing's triad. Heart rate's supposed to be 60 to 100, right? So when you see bradycardia, you see that low heart rate, you see the high blood pressure with a widened pulse pressure and irregular respirations, that's called Cushing's, pri uh, Cushing's triad, okay? And it is an ominous sign. We're going to talk about that shortly. Very good. Select all that applies. Increased intracranial pressure is a situation that results from an increase in any or all of which three components? Select all that apply. Brain tissue, blood, cerebral spinal fluid, nerve cells. So when we're talking about increased intracranial pressure, this is a situation that results from an increase of what? Select all that apply. Thank you, Glam Nurse Chris. I didn't even know you guys could share this live on Facebook. Thank you. How'd you do that? Do the Facebook people, do they own TikTok as well? Hmm.
Okay, very good. Most of you guys chose the correct answers. So when it comes to increased intracranial pressure, that is a result of having too much brain tissue, blood, and or what? Cerebral spinal fluid. Very good. True or false? Displacement and herniation of brain tissue can cause a potentially reversible process to become irreversible. Is this true or is this false? Displacement and herniation of brain tissue can cause a potentially reversible process to become irreversible. True. Think about it, guys. Compression of the brain stem and the cranial nerves, that can cause what? Can you come back from? No, you can't. That's irreversible. Once you're, you're, that's it. True. It's lethal, guys. Type in your answer. If compression of the brain stem is unrelieved, blank arrest will occur due to compression of the medulla. What's the answer? If compression of the brainstem is unrelieved, blank arrest will occur due to compression of the medulla. Type in your answer. You guys are doing the most on this live. Cardiac, true, heart, neurological, cardiovascular. Really? Let me move this out the way. It's respiratory. And I knew the minute I wrote arrest, everyone's going to think cardiac arrest. Let's go back to this question. Compression of the brainstem. If that's unrelieved, blank arrest will occur due to compression of the medulla. What is the medulla? That is the respiratory center of the brain. So compression of the brainstem, if it's unrelieved, it's going to cause what? Respiratory arrest. Hello, we're talking about increased intracranial pressure. You guys need to know that, guys. The medulla is the respiratory center of the brain. You absolutely need to know that. No, nine lives ask, are these really NCLEX questions? They seem too easy. I hope they're that this simple. They are not this simple. This is a Kahoot. Kahoot only allows you to have so many um, characters. So I have to get to the point. So my questions are very direct. If you want NCLEX type of questions, you have to go to my YouTube channel and watch my Q&A videos because I don't have any character limitations on those. Okay, guys, let's go. Next question. This is ordered response. Which of the following sequences best describes the progression of events that leads to increased intracranial pressure? So guys, take your mouse and put your options in the correct order. Here are your options. The brain tissues compressed leading to herniation. Cerebral edema or increased blood volume causes a rise in ICP. Intracranial pressure rises above normal levels because of vasodilation, and the brain compensates by shifting cerebral spinal fluid into the spinal subarachnoid space. Again, which of the following sequences best describes the progression of events that actually lead to increased ICP? So in other words, guys, what is the pathophysiology of increased intracranial pressure? If you're typing on the live, it's more than one answer. You got to put it in order. Okay. Only four people got this correct. Here's the order. First, you have cerebral edema or increased blood volume that causes a rise in the intracranial pressure. 
And then the brain compensates by shifting cerebral spinal fluid into the spinal subarachnoid space. And then intracranial pressure rises above normal levels because of vasodilation. Now, this is important for you guys to know because this may be a separate test question. You do have to know that. That vasodilation, guys, we're seeing this because of de decreased perfusion. To what? The brain. Decreased cerebral perfusion. That's why we're seeing this. And then last, the brain tissue becomes compressed, leading to what? Herniation. That's a medical emergency. Which of the following conditions is most likely to most likely to cause cerebral edema? Would it be hyperthyroidism? Would it be severe head injury? Would it be hypokalemia or would it be COPD? Which of the following conditions is most likely to cause cerebral edema? Very good. Severe head injury. So when we're talking about cerebral edema, guys, that's basically like um, the buildup or the accumulation of fluid within the extravascular space of the brain. Okay, that's what we're dealing with. And other things that can cause um, cerebral edema besides severe head injury, and that can be from and then VA, it could be from someone swinging a bat against their head, anything that could cause severe head injury. But there are other causes. It could be caused by a tumor. It could be caused by abscess. It could be caused by, um, um, what else can cause cerebral edema? Hemorrhage, right? So there are so many other causes, but a severe head injury, that is one of the most, one of the leading causes. Now let's look at the wrong answer choices hyperthyroidism no hyperthyroidism would mess with what your metabolic processes hypokalemia no nope. hypokalemia that could cause cardiac dysrhythmias or arrhythmias muscle weakness and copd that would mess with what your gas exchange but for this question we're talking about cerebral edema true or false Cushing's triad is a medical emergency and is a sign of brainstem compression and impending death. True or false? Everyone should get this right because I accidentally gave you this, as this answer when I was explaining something else. Everyone should get this correct. True or false? True. Again, bradycardia hypertension with um, a widened pulse pressure. And what's the third one of Cushing's triad? Oh, the irregular respirations. Those three. Absolutely true. Which of the following is the most likely cause of this abnormal posture? Look at that posture, guys. This is called desperate posturing, which is the most likely cause. Is it damage to the cerebral cortex? Is it injury to the upper spinal cord? Is it damage to the midbrain or brainstem? Or is it increased intracranial pressure without brainstem involvement? What do you guys think? Only 19 of you guys got it correct. It is damage to the midbrain or brainstem. Let me see what the other 19 chose. Increase intracranial pressure without brainstem involvement? No. So guys, let's talk about that. That posturing that you just saw, that's desperate posturing. You guys need to recognize desperate posturing visually if you see it or if it's described to you. Because if you're in a nursing program right now or you're studying for NCLEX, it's been presented both ways. This is a famous test question. You have to be able to recognize it both ways, okay? So you see what it looks like, but if it's described, how's it gonna be described? Remember, those arms were extended. Those wrists were rotated outwards. The legs were extended. They were straight, right? It wasn't a flex, 
a flex position, the patient was in extended position, okay? So that's desperate posturing. And you need to understand when you see this, you know there's most likely what? Damage to the midbrain or brain stem. Which of the following positions is most appropriate to help reduce increased intracranial pressure? Here are your options. Transdellensburg, supine, semi-fowlers, or sideline. So Trendelensburg would be position, the head would be lower than the feet. Supine would be with the pillow under the neck for support. Semi-fowlers would be with the head of the bed elevated 30 degrees. And then sideline position would be with the head turned to one side. What do you guys think? Very good. Semi Fowler's position with the head of the bed elevated 30 degrees. And guess what? That head's going to be midline, right? It's not going to be flexed. It's not going to be hyperextended. It's not going to be rotated. It's going to be midline elevated. What? 30 degrees. Why? Because that helps um, with the drainage of fluid, right? All of these other positions that you're looking at, Transdellenberg, uh, supine with a pillow under the neck and sideline with the head turned to one side, guess what? That decreases venous return. And with decreasing venous return, that's going to do what? Increase intracranial pressure. The only good position here is going to be that semi follows position. Again, head of bed elevated. And remember, head in what? Straight neutral position. Professor D, do I need to know that for testing purposes? Absolutely. I promise you're going to see it again somewhere. Don't say I didn't warn you. Okay, last question. Which of the following assessment findings would indicate to the nurse that mannitol is effective? Is it decreased your output and stable blood pressure? Is it improved a level of consciousness and decreased ICP readings? Is it increased heart rate and elevated respiratory rate? Or is it increased blood pressure and signs of peripheral edema? Which would let us know that that medication mannitol that we gave is effective? Very good. Improved level of consciousness, decreased ICP readings. Think about it. Um, what is mannitol? It's an osmotic diuretic. We're giving this to um, drain fluid out of the, the brain, right? So we know it's working if one, the level of consciousness is improved because guess what? Patient has anything going on with the brain. What is the first indication of you knowing something's wrong? Change in level of consciousness. That patient who was awake, alert, oriented, all of a sudden they're confused. All of a sudden, they're disoriented. All of a sudden, they're lethargic, right? So one of the signs to let us know that it's improving, it's getting better, is an improved level of consciousness. And the next part says decreased ICP. Well, that's why we're giving them um, this diuretic because the intracranial pressure is too high. So we know it's working if it starts to do what? Go down. Look at the wrong answer choices decreased urine output and stable blood pressure. See, I tried to trick you with the stable blood pressure part, but look at the decreased urine output. If you're giving an osmotic diuretic, what do diuretics do that make you urinate? So why are we seeing decreased urine output? That couldn't be the answer. Next, increased heart rate and elevated respiratory rate. Let me tell you guys something. And this is a common theme throughout nursing. If you see elevated heart rate, and elevated respirations together. When I say elevated, I mean outside of the normal value. So heart rate supposed to be 60 to 100. Respiration supposed to be 12 to 22. If you see both of them together, you see these two organs, the heart and the lungs, elevated, big red flag. We don't know what's wrong, but we know something is seriously wrong with the patient, right? So if we see tachycardia and tachypnea together, whatever we did is not working. So that couldn't be the answer. And then last, it says increased blood pressure and signs of peripheral edema. Well, those both are horrible. We're giving diuretic. We're trying to decrease fluid, decrease that blood pressure, decrease the edema, right? If we see this, that means it's not working. It even got worse. So the only correct answer is improved level of consciousness and decreased ICP. All right, guys. And that was the last question. Let's see how you guys did.